Welcome to the latest episode of High Output AI, where Tom and Elliot talk AI and the tools and technologies that make AI happen. We've done it. We've done it. We are in person. Tom and Elliot in the same room, proving and that we are not deep fakes of one another. Oh. But we are simulations. Quite possibly. Yeah. We, we may all be a simulation. Uh, oh, that's that's a spicy. Yeah, I mean, a spicy drink you've made us. Yes. So we're having uh, caipirinhas because I have a bottle of cachaça, or, or did have a bottle of cachaça. <laughs> uh, so if this show is a little more unhinged than our regular episodes, uh, that's why. Uh, but look, we're in the same room. We got a plant. <laughs> Otherwise, yep. it was a pretty plain background. Uh, we're sitting in my office in Brisbane. Uh, hanging out in person, doing all that good stuff, but uh, let's get stuck into it, mate. What what are we talking about today? So we have a big day ahead of us. Uh, lots of stuff's happened this week in the world of AI. So we're going to kick off today we're talking about Tesla and the AI day that they recently had. We're going to talk about the AI component, not the robot component, because no one really liked the robot component. We're then going to jump into a interesting topic about data laundering and the idea of free use of copyrighted material in training models. And then because, you know, we got to go for three weeks in a row, we're going to be talking about Stadia once again for the third topic today. Stadia. So yeah, um, but just a bit of a, before we do that, let's just say welcome to all the new subscribers again this week and all the new viewers that we've got. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, please do subscribe, hit that like button and press the bell button. Uh, and if you're not, uh, leave us a review on whatever you're listening on as well. So, um, but Elliot. Yes. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. So Tesla AI Day. So each year Tesla, uh, obviously the car company Tesla, holds a, holds a day where they reveal what they've been working on in the AI space. They're one of the leaders, especially in the computer vision world. And, this year, and this year they uh, did a two part, kind of a two parts to their AI Day. The first part was based on their robot that they're releasing, which is a humanoid. And it was, uh, from the robotic community, seemed like a bit of a fail, was the general consensus. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm not a, I'm not a robotics guy myself, but it was, uh, it was a bit meh. Like, yeah. I mean, look, it's cool. Anybody who builds a humanoid robot, you know, you get, you get certain kudos in the <sighs> engineering world. Um, these, these are particularly strong. They're beverages. basically straight run. <laughs> yeah. We didn't have any ice either. So, uh, but I don't think that was the coolest part of AI no. day. Let's let's give them that little bit of uh Exactly. Leader. Exactly. So the first component, component was the robotics and the second was all around their computer vision and their AI work and development for their fully self-driving cars. And that was super cool, I thought. So they've made lots of progress in the last year. They've now gone from 2,000 cars, fully self-driving cars, to 160,000. And what's really cool about all of these cars is that they are now all gathering data and using and also building their database, but also Tesla's done a lot of work in the background of auto labeling and essentially almost auto training all of their models in this space. And there was kind of three things that we thought were really interesting that we wanted to talk about today. The first one was the models itself. Mm -hmm. The second thing was all of the training and data that came uh, behind these models and what allowed them to create these uh, these new models. And then the third area that we wanted to jump into is the hardware that they have built, custom built, to be able to do all of this. And it's all pretty impressive across all three fronts. Yeah, 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 it sure is. It was a cool presentation. Uh, lots of different people speaking on the stage. Yep. Um, Tom and I were commenting that uh, it's, a, it's quite a young cohort yep. running the AI team. Um, nothing wrong with that, but it was uh, it was interesting to see how many probably, you know, late 20s, early to mid 30 year olds, uh, unless there's something going on at Tesla where they all get, you know, injected with uh, stem cells every <laughs> six months and these guys are all really 60. But it yeah. uh, seemed like a young crowd, which is cool, which, yeah. you know, to anyone listening uh, or watching who's, you know, Tom and I are, are both in our 30s, early 30s. Uh, no I, stem cells. No stem cells, not yet at least, <laughs> and probably like doing bad things to our body with, these nasty drinks and things. Um, but I think it's it's definitely easy to be at the forefront of AI without, you know, a ton of gray hairs. Not that I'm short on gray hairs these days. But, yeah, uh, yeah look, if you're watching this and you're early in your career, 
uh, or even, you know, you're later in your career and, and AI is something that's just piqued your interest. It doesn't take all that many years of experience to be right there up the top, uh, which is quite cool. Yeah, very, very much so. And what, so on the model front, we're going to be talking about two models that they've, uh, that they've been working on. And by two models, I mean, obviously, there's a number of models within them, but two areas. The first one is their planning, their planning model. So imagine if, uh, pl imagine you got the car is planning its trip through items, uh, through, through traffic, through obstacles. And then the second is the lane and objects model. And they're two different, mm. two very different models. Uh, the, the uh, planning model is a, from a Nerf, a Nerf style model, which we uh, will get you to explain uh, for us. Um, but we'll kind of run through in, uh, in their like top, their top level things of what they've been able to do. So over the last year, they've released, they've made 35 different releases and they've shipped over 281 models. Now we're not exactly sure what those numbers mean, whether that's 281 new models or, or version 1.02 of the other model, but lots of, lots of, uh, Lots of uh, updates across the year for their fully self-driving cars. They've they've done eighteen thousand pull requests. They've done they've trained another seventy five thousand models on top of the ones they released, and they have a four point eight million clip data set. So big numbers here, and it's probably one of the biggest AI efforts in the world. It's fair to say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can imagine. I think they said something like thirty petabytes of data. Yeah. In their training. Database, you know, they've built a custom uh, supercomputer, which really just means like a bunch of GPUs tacked together with some yeah. some storage. But there's a gigantuan amount of data. There's eight cameras on each car, um, looking sort of straight out the front, a little bit to the side, directly on the side, and then I think some semi. Couple backups as well. Yeah, um, and you know, if that's capturing data at, you know, a few times a second. Uh, and processing that and sending that up to a cloud somewhere, that's that's a lot of data. That's probably, you know, rivaling YouTube in terms of the amount of new video data that's coming in every day. It's amazing. Yeah. So I was wondering if we can start off with this Nerf, uh, with these Nerf models in the planning. I'm wondering whether you can speak us through them and what a Nerf model is and what they're hoping to achieve with those models. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, this model, this first one that we're going to talk about, it's how, I guess, the car sort of builds its picture of the world. Um, so part of that is NERF, which is a neural radiance field, uh, which is kind of like radar uh, or any sort of depth detecting modality from the past. So it's all about taking a static image. So, you know, if you're viewing this on YouTube right now, you can see Tom and myself, you can see the pot plant, uh, and you can see this, this microphone uh, boom arm. They're obviously, we're obviously all not jammed up against this wall behind here. We're sitting at different depths. Uh, this microphone is in front of me. Uh, and a radiance field uh, is a way of measuring or, or assigning for each pixel in this image a distance. Um, and you can then use that to, I guess, get a semi-3D version of the world. There's some limitations on that if you've only got one viewpoint in that, you know, if something's hidden, like one of my hands is behind the other, um, there's no way that you can get that from video data, but when you've got six cameras at different angles and things like that, you can build a pretty robust picture of the world. Yeah. And, uh, it's, it's very interesting that they've gone this method about a year ago, they completely scrapped their LIDAR technology and they found out that it seems that these Nerf models are more efficient at calculating depth than actual rate LIDAR. Yeah, it's it's pretty wild to me. I mean, there's a lot of startups in the uh, in the lidar space, and I think there's still room for lidar in the industry. But Tesla saying we're just going to use video, uh, it was a pretty big kick to a lot of the well, likely a big kick. I, yeah. I don't intimately know the goings on in these companies, but you know that's a that's a big call. Um, yeah, because lidar itself can give you an actual distance field because it's all about the light going out and bouncing back and measuring time of flight and things like that to really simplify that. Um, whereas here, you just estimate it. Um, but obviously, getting consumer-grade camera gear or, or even high-end camera gear is much, much cheaper than LiDAR um, because we've got existing supply chains for these technologies and we can get them a lot more readily. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. And uh, 
if you haven't seen the video as well, we'll link it obviously, but uh, the uh, the recording of AI Day, but it's fantastic to see how they recreate these worlds once they do get that depth, once they do get the under... Mm. And the way they create it is by objects and polygons, correct? Or, or... Yeah, I mean, the, the goal of these setups is to create this sort of... I mean, if you've ever played Minecraft or something like that, like it's that sort of level. It's this big blocky representation of the world within the view of the car. And it tries to, I guess, get an idea where solid objects are and also tries to classify them into, uh, you know, this is a wall. It's an immovable solid object. Uh, this is a, another vehicle. It is a moving solid object, which might move on its own accord. Uh, or this is a slightly less solid object, like a, a person uh, or a tree or a bush or something like that, which, you know, we don't want to hit. Uh, but is going to have different dynamics to uh, you know, a bus or a wall. And it uses that information in its route planning. So it takes that very coarse representation of the world, that sort of Minecraft block style view, turns that into a number of entities. So you can imagine you know, the bus is made up of a number of different Lego bricks. And then you turn that into one solid entity, which has you know, some bounds around it. And might be moving at a certain velocity in a certain direction. And then it has, you know, this database of objects and their, I guess, their, their physics, how they're moving, where they're moving, how that is accelerating or decelerating. And it uses all of that to run these like mini simulations about if I choose to merge onto the highway right now, given all of these moving objects that I see, is it going to be safe? Am I going to have to cut off some people and, and you know, activate the horn module uh, to tell them to get stuffed? Or can we safely merge at this at this point in time? And uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's very interesting. So it, it kind of forms two functions, this model, the planning one. One is it's to create the world that the car lives in, create the universe, and then to plan the route through it. And listening to the, listening to the talk, it gave a really cool explanation as to how it plans that, which is an optimized tree search. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the interesting way that they optimized this tree search was rather than run a million calculations as to which way is most likely to result in the safest outcome for the car, they actually use it to, uh, they actually filter out options that a human would most likely not take. So, mm -hmm. for example, uh, most human drivers are not jerks or not, uh, the example they give is most human drivers are not jerks and will not try and speed out into that gap really quickly and hit that gap. But... And so what the, what the tree search would do would actually, in the scenario that was created where you were a jerk and you sped out in front, it would actually say humans don't really do that. We're going to cut that and so we're not going to explore mm. that. Um, have you seen any other like tree searches like this or like some in other areas that, uh, that have been successful or is this like a completely novel, so novel I think, way for this? I mean, tree, tree searches themselves are a pretty well established, pretty well used algorithm for reinforcement learning, sort of complex dynamic system optimization type scenarios. So uh, back in the old days, you know, you can even imagine the, the simplest scenario or, or a very simple scenario is like a game of tic-tac-toe and you can build a tree based on, you know, what moves the opponent makes and you make and trace those down to all of the possible states for that tic-tac-toe board. Uh, and then if you're building an AI to solve that problem, it can, you know, look ahead in the tree and say, I've got six different options. Which one's going to lead to the most wins? And a lot of the early chess engines and things like that were using tree search. It, it's a lot of the way that these uh, game AI models work and sort of deep cue learning, a lot of the reinforcement learning algorithms uh, use, a, I guess, a more advanced variant of yeah. tree search in that they're sort of forecasting scenarios um, and exploring this sort of scenario space which may not necessarily be a tree in some of the more modern uh, optimizations, but I guess it's trying to balance short-term outcomes with long-term outcomes. Yep. So it's like, yeah, we can speed up and you know the car physically can make this, this corner, but is that going to be the optimal long-term outcome for us? Yeah. You know, so uh, it's quite cool to see all these different, I guess, machine learning technologies and, and different bits and pieces coming together into this system. Yeah, it's a very cool, very cool explanation and concept of how they consider planning a route for a car. Now, obviously, 
to plan the route, you need to know where the car is meant to be going mm. and where it's meant to be staying within. And as they said, provide planning can be very regimented, very mathematical and very, very rules based. However, there is a lot of semantics in the world of driving and real life that we don't quite understand. So, for example, all the lanes and merging and forks in the road and uh, happenings of people crossing the road or a car pulling out. And the next model, which is the lanes and objects one, is the semantics of the world, the things that we're used to as humans. And what I found really, really interesting about this model was it was a computer vision model, but they seem to be taking a lot of work from the natural language processing world in the form of attention. Mm. Um, and there was an example given about an intersection, four lanes meeting four lanes in four-way intersection. So a total of 16 lane kind of uh, 16 lanes and countless possibilities as to which way you wanted to go. Not countless, but large amount of possibilities lot, yeah. as to which, uh, yeah. which way to go and which lane to be in. And the way that they considered calculating which was the most likely lane that the car needed to stay in, et cetera, was this idea of creating this lane language, which mm. was a very cool concept. Wondering whether you could talk about how they've managed to include this, the world of attention into computer vision. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is quite cool. So they, I mean, at the core, what they've done is they've defined a new grammar, a new sort of tokenization of the problem space that they were working in. In this case, it was lanes. And they invented a number of different, you know, you can token symbols, you can think of them as words to represent different parts of describing that scene. Yes, we've got Midas um, here today with us as well. <laughs> yes, everyone say hello to my dog Midas. What do you think about the tokenization of the lanes? <laughs> Good. Um, and so by, by shifting the problem, I guess, from a, a traditional computer vision problem, which might be semantic segmentation on pictures of the road, to a graph processing problem where, you know, you define it in terms of this new grammar, uh, they can make use of a lot of these sequence-to-sequence -sequence models that we're seeing in large language models, for example, uh, and take information about the scene, embed it in a space that can then be tokenized, and then ask it to describe things like, please describe this intersection. Mm. And it'll give you a series of, say, sentences, sentences being a loose, a loose term here, um, that describe the entire way that the different lane-to-lane -lane connections are made up. Yep. And then the car can use that representation, which goes from, you know, six cameras, millions of pixels, you know, 50 times a second to a much, much smaller, denser representation, which is we're coming up to a four-lane intersection. Uh, you're in the second lane from the left, which is a go straight lane. We want to go right, so we're going to need to shift into either the next lane to the right or the one over. Uh, and given that we're going to want to turn left, at the next intersection, let's just go one lane to the right. Uh, and we sort of constrain the domain of the problem that we're working with from all these pixels to something that I think is a lot closer to how humans would understand uh, a car pulling up to an intersection, which I think is really, really cool. And I think the real magic that we haven't mentioned here is that they have to do this all with very, very low latency and lag. This has yeah. to all be done very, very quickly. And so there is a huge optimization around how do we focus in on the correct part of the problem very, very quickly? How do we like exclude things with high degree of confidence that can be excluded? So mm. in this case, for example, driving into lanes of oncoming traffic, we can just exclude them from the problem set very quickly. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> spicy, spicy sip there, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> getting to the bottom half of this. I might, I might actually have a sour beer soon if I'm not careful. This is like, <laughs> this is how gross this is. <laughs> um, uh, so I think we'll, we'll keep shuffling along because we've got so much to so much to cover today. But um, anything else to add on these two models that you that we haven't talked about so far? So I think you know one thing for for the listener out there who is you know probably working in AI and thinks, oh my god, how do they get this stuff done? I think the thing that I noticed a lot is that these systems are not one magical AI model that solves all the problems. They're not a brand new methodology of how to do artificial intelligence. Yep. What they're doing is they're taking the best in class for solving different categories of problems, framing their problem mm. as that type of problem and piecing these things together into a system. And I think a lot of applied machine learning, certainly in our experience, um, you know, within the healthcare space and, and here in, in the world of Tesla is that applied machine learning is just that it is, taking the existing 
models, working out how to bring your problem into that domain and piecing this stuff together and building the glue and the layers in between that allow these different models to communicate with one another. And a lot of that is very accessible. You know, we've seen some pretty amazing stuff recently where, you know, people are modifying, say, Stable Diffusion or Whisper mm. or any of these other cool models that have come out into pretty interesting little products, but they're not, they're not training new models. They're not designing new AI systems. They're just taking these pieces and using them the same way that you would use a Python library or a, you know, a front-end design system like Tailwind yep. and putting these pieces together. And I think for most people in the space, unless you're an, a pure AI researcher, that's going to be most of your job. Yep. And it's just so cool to see how accessible that's becoming. And that this team here said, look, the language, natural language processing people are doing a really good job here. Let's try and work out how to take our previous problem and reframe it there because if we can do that, we can tap into this very rich ecosystem of models and techniques and methodologies that uh, that exist already. Yeah, and this is why I love the space. You can smell the innovation in the air, like mm. people taking things from different applications and seeing how they work. It's fantastic. Yeah. But let's jump into uh, the training and data behind it. One thing obviously Tesla has to their advantage is they have 1.4 billion clips being gathered all the time. It's yeah. insane the amount of data that they have. Yeah. And we'll get to the infrastructure a little bit afterwards, but they have so much data where they've now had to focus on how do we train, how do we label this data? Mm. And a large part of their effort has been on auto labeling and also uh, gathering data where they're, and, and, and creating data, synthetic data, in areas that they're weak on that isn't gathered that often. Because they've got so much data everywhere, but there's some areas that they're very weak on. And they had some very cool, uh, some uh, cool synth uh, ways that they created, uh, both auto-labeled and then created synthetic data. Can you talk about any of those things for us? Yeah, I mean, the, the auto-labeling, which I always find a funny term in this space because it's just like, it's not really auto labeling in the way you might initially think, which is like give it some pictures of roads and it'll just magically come up with the mm. labels. What they're doing is they're saying, okay, look, we can put a certain amount of, of people hours into labeling data, uh, but we don't have an infinite number mm. of resources. And if we've got, let's say, two trips down the same stretch of highway from two different cars and we've labeled one of them, but we haven't labeled the other, but we've got the acceleration data and the temperature and some other data from that second system, we might as well make use of those labels because let's be frank, roads don't change that often. Mm. The actual road itself looks pretty much the same one Wednesday to the next. Uh, and they've come up with systems to say, look, we know the GPS data of the car, we know its trajectory, how it's moving. Uh, let's use that information to take data from other trips and reuse that labeling mm. data to then get, you know, similar scenes, but from maybe different times of day, different weather conditions and things uh, labeled in the same way. And it's really like, it's like label leverage more than auto labeling, um, which I think is, it's still very cool. And, and I'm sure it's a massive engineering effort to align all of that information. Um, the simulation stuff is quite cool. I haven't looked into that as much. I know back in the day, um, I don't know if it was Tesla, but generally in the self-driving space, people were using uh, Grand Theft Auto V because you could, uh, you could put somebody in a car and drive around areas. And uh, it wasn't, obviously it's not a perfect translation of real-world traffic, especially, you know. Yeah. It explains why like yeah. some Tesla's cars just jump off cliffs every now and again, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And, and machine gun down, you know, <laughs> the, the gangsters on the side of the road or whatever happens in GTA V. I don't think I've played Grand Theft Auto since <laughs> yeah. Vice City. Um, but uh, I think it's getting a lot more advanced. And if you think about, um, you know, simulating a driving environment when we've got 3D modeling and, and pretty good geospatial data, you can get a sort of first pass in mm. environment data pretty well, um, especially when you've done, you know, if you've done 50 trips down a road before and you want to capture data of that same road, but you want to put a put a you know an old lady pushing a shopping cart across the crossing. Yeah. You get ninety percent of the way there with your existing footage. You yeah. just have to simulate old lady pushing shopping cart. Yeah. Um, which which is, you can probably take from another from another segment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm sure there is somebody within Tesla working on sort of mashing together. The, yeah, or the the stable diffusion esque of driving. 
you know, yeah. which is like, please give me a downtown Colorado during a snowstorm. Bus pulling out. Bus pulling out. Old lady with shopping cart full of oranges. Um, yeah. And, you know. It'll, it'll... Slightly stoned driver because it's Colorado. <laughs> yeah. And it'll be that classic scene of, you know, they swerve out of the way. The lady tips her cart out. The oranges go everywhere. Yeah. And, uh. I don't know, some car chasing ensues. That's the scene from The Matrix, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, moving yeah, probably. on. So, uh, and then the thing that underpins all of this is, you know, what we all have access to, which is 14,000 GPUs. Yeah. So. Yeah, holy smokes. So uh, just some little facts on the hardware that they've created. So they've got 1.4 billion frames to train on, uh, to, it takes to train. They've got about 100,000 GPU hours to, uh, they need about 100,000 GPU hours to train that model. Uh, and they've got a 30 petabyte video cache. A 30 petabyte video cache. It, I mean, what's and what's crazy about that to me is that that's the cache. Yeah. They, which is like a rolling... Uh, what they do is they, they yeah. bring new video data into the cache and spit new data right. out. Rather than thinking of a pool of data, they've yeah. had to like turn it into a pipe yeah. because they've got so much coming through at any point. Yeah, I, I think to me that's just amazing. I mean, yeah. imagine if ImageNet or any of these other large data sets that you use, yeah. like the Wikipedia data set for language models, if that was just like, look, this is too much. There's too much data yeah. on Wikipedia. So we'll just give you like a thousand yeah. pages a day and then yeah. we just rotate that through, but we cannot physically give you yeah. this much data. Now, obviously with Wikipedia, you can download all of Wikipedia because yeah. it's mostly text, but video like this or like YouTube, if you realistically wanted to train a model on YouTube data, you can't store all the data that YouTube has. So you've just got to be like, give me... 10 hours of video that was uploaded in the last two days. Uh, and I'm going to do that every day, but my computer at home, you know, despite its big hard drive, cannot store even a tiny fraction yep. of all the data that YouTube has. So they've created their own supercomputer with stitching together 14,000 GPUs. But as, as they say, as they say in the, yeah, I looked up and something the video sells like a couple of hundred thousand a quarter, like, that's a large portion of all of the GPUs in the world. Yeah. I wonder what models they are running. Like what are GPU? The, do you think they're made in-house or like? Um, well, I mean, some of the latest stuff in that video suggested that they're starting to do custom hardware, yeah. but uh, it'd be pretty wild to imagine like some Tesla employee going down to Best Buy or whatever and just being like, look, <laughs> just give me every 3080 Ti that you have. He's like, okay, how many How many do you need? We got heaps. It's like, oh, about 14,000, please. Yeah. Which I imagine is not the way that Tesla sources its GPUs, but I don't reckon they did it that way. But anyway, you so they, so, um, and as they as they jump into in the video, it's not it's not just uh, during the presentation. It's not just a put. It's just not just let's get fourteen thousand GPUs and mm. run some stuff through them. There is a lot that's had to go into this as well, and they've had to make the bottleneck the GPUs mm. because they're the most expensive components. So they've had to oversize everything else around that. Yeah, I think that's a really good design philosophy and a really interesting part of this talk is that they said, look, yeah, as you say, GPUs are the most expensive bit. We can get RAM, we can get memory. Uh, sorry, we can get RAM, we can get CPU, we can get storage. <laughs> I didn't want to pull you up on that because yeah, no, usually, no, no. usually you're... Uh... <laughs> um, uh, for cents on the dollar compared to a GPU, so let's work out how to make this massively parallel. Mm. Let's make the optimizations or the changes we need to in software so that the GPUs are basically running as efficiently as possible. Yep. Because if they're if they've got downtime, if we're wasting all our time taking our data from disk into RAM into GPU, then we've spent this money on fourteen thousand GPUs, and GPUs yep. aren't cheap. Uh, I mean, look, if you're Elon, you can buy Twitter, you can buy GPUs, <laughs> whatever you want. I'm sure you can. You Twitter, can get a Twitter, will, uh, Elon will buy Nvidia. That's the next thing. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, spicy prediction. You heard it here first. Elon buys NVIDIA. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's it's cool. And, you know, they made modifications to PyTorch. It's interesting that they're using PyTorch. Yeah, um, that, I saw that. I thought they, like, they're making their own silicon, but they're still using PyTorch. I found that funny. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, PyTorch is pretty good. I, I spent a lot of the last five or six years in TensorFlow, only really started in PyTorch in the last 12 months. Not for any particular reason. It was yeah. just like we were using TensorFlow, so let's keep using TensorFlow. Um, but PyTorch is quite good. Yeah. I like it. it Evidently. It, yeah, I mean, it's quite easy to work with. And 
I mean, Elon seems to like it. Or, I mean, I don't think Elon's actually writing any bad <laughs> One thing code. I will say about Elon at the day, he clearly didn't know what was happening. He was very underprepared for it. He walks out and he's like, we built some robots and we're going to talk about some AI. I'm out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, I, people need to remember, Tesla has a lot of he, employees. He had a lot going on that day. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a busy man. He's got, uh, you know... Six trillion different companies trying to buy a, a million more. Yeah, and he's going to buy NVIDIA soon. So yeah, he's... social commentary on all of the world's events. He's, yeah. he's, he's got a lot going on. He launched a perfume line. Wait, what? Yeah, yeah. He said, you know, given my last name, I can't believe it's been this long. But uh, uh. yeah, and then like, oh man, this is such a uh, detour. But <laughs> hey, you, you finished your drink, so you're allowed to I, detour. I have not. There's at least half left. Um, he said... Uh, yeah, please buy my perfume so that I can buy Twitter. Um, well, he sold was, flamethrowers to fund um, Boring Co., remember? Yes, yes, yes. Anyway, sidetrack. Back to 14,000 GPUs. Yeah, it's a lot of GPUs. Yeah. I mean, let's hope that these guys update every year yeah. and we can get a whole bunch of you know last year's GPUs that sends on the dollar from the old uh, yeah. Tesla warehouse, but probably not. So the next, the next big uh, item of news within the hardware space for Tesla is that they've theoretically created their own silicon and uh mm. which i think is just like so interesting to me because this is like the equivalent of like electricity companies making their own copper wires or like mining companies building their own diggers i'm sure there's a better word for it than diggers e excavators like, yeah excavators yeah. and drag yeah. lines like they are building their own shovels here which uh seems funny to me and it's Obviously, a trend across the industry with Apple Silicon and uh, mm -hmm. to some extent uh, Amazon's own silicon. Do they have any, or did I make that up? Yeah, no. Amazon yeah. has some some APU op, uh, AI. Yeah, maybe they call them the APU. I don't know. Can't remember what they're called, but they're supposedly pretty good. The TPUs from uh, Google are supposedly pretty good. Microsoft has been playing around with the idea. I don't know if they've launched anything just yet. I can't remember, but. Yeah, doing your own silicon fab seems to be more and more popular. I mean, we say it's a new idea, but if you look, it's a new idea as far as like American companies are concerned. Mm. But if you have a look overseas at somebody like Samsung, I mean, Samsung uh, is probably the best example of end-to-end. -end. You know, they will own mines, ports, Fabrication labs. They started in shipping. Consumer didn't they? hardware. They, yeah, they, they build ships to begin with. Yeah, yeah. They, they're they, still they, privately owned. They're still there is a yeah, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Samsung out yeah, there. Yeah, absolutely wild. Um, which I think I think there's a lot to be learned there. You know, like there, everyone says, oh, you know, the the iPhone is going to destroy Samsung and things like this. But to Samsung, the consumer grade phones that they have, um, which are which are quite popular and competed quite well. Yeah, it's like one brick in a giant wall. You know, so it's interesting that Tesla's doing this. Um, I mean, it, it makes sense in some cases, but also it's strange to yeah. me. Like, I get that the GPUs are expensive. I get that there's a bit of a bottleneck there. I'm just not convinced that, like, rolling your own hardware – and all of the complexities that come from that. And like, you know, I am an electrical engineer. I do somewhat know what I'm talking about here. It uh, it seems like, yeah, I don't know. To me, it smells like the problem must be very, very big to justify you making your own hardware. Like, yeah. it must be bigger than what we're understanding. They must have run yeah, into yeah, either cost or constraint problems that we, we, we don't hear about. Yeah, look, the, and there are plenty of models where it makes sense and, and my guess is that there's stuff that I don't know, that yeah. we don't know that justifies this, not that they're just idiots. Yeah. I never assume that they're just idiots. But, yeah, I mean, one one scenario in which it could make sense is if you can replicate the same hardware in the data center in the car yeah. and then start to optimize sort of that flow, you know, maybe that makes a lot of sense um, because eventually we're going to need more and more processing in vehicle. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, at if, the mo at the moment it's only running a certain amount of models, and those models are only going to get more and more yeah expansive. Yeah, exactly. So if this is the MVP of that, yeah, maybe that makes sense. Yeah, I do, well, this just generally happens in the world of like capitalism, where when profits start to really accrue to people, people will just go after them. That's and that's I think what we're seeing here, which is 
people have been sick of these silicon manufacturers becoming some of the most Nvidia becoming some of the most valuable companies in the world, and this is their moving up the value chain to to eat into some of those profit pools. But anyway, yeah, we don't yeah, know. yeah, definitely. I mean, I think we've mentioned this on the podcast before: is that like Nvidia and Intel, like they really, in my opinion, need to work out how to be fab for hire. Yeah. Which is like, look, you've got a problem. We've got the distribution. Yeah. We've got the experience. We know how to design these systems. Yeah. We'll build you custom chips um, because... Absolutely. Yeah, more and more it seems that people have very specific needs. I mean, GPUs, at the end of the day, most GPUs were designed originally and have been iterated on from a graphics processing yeah. mentality. I mean, there's more AI cores or tensor cores or whatever is being described here, but... You know, if you listen to the conversation they were having around what their chips were designed to do, it's like dense dot products between two yep. vectors, you know, which is probably very specific to their AI model. And I think, you know, the more we see convolutional neural nets or transformers or anything like that in actual AI applications, the more it makes sense to make custom silicon. And the 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 GPU switches from being a very general graphics processing. Yep. We can do whatever we want to. Okay, you do dot products a whole bunch. We've got some optimized silicon. And we saw it with the, 30, the 3080, right? With yeah. Ethereum and, yeah. like, and Bitcoin mining, right? Like, yeah. It's just like that was a basically fit for purpose GPU for on the consumer side of things. And like compute is going to become a commodity. Like it's going to become a commodity. And therefore, the only way to differentiate yourself if you're in NVIDIA mm. is to be able to provide specific solutions for very specific needs and like own the major contracts with the Teslas and the AWSs of the world. But yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I agree. So, we'll, I mean, we'll see if they move that way. Um, it'll be interesting, you know, in the context of the US with a lot of the funding around local silicon production, yeah. whether local providers decide to go down the specialization route or the more, I guess, platform play of we'll make your silicon. You know, Tesla, come yeah. to us. We've got the economies of scale to do this. But I think it's going to, from an economics point of view, it's going to, like, they're going to stick with the platform to begin with. Like, Making a consumer product is way more risky and way more harder to nail than it is to like get some large contract that funds your funds it up front, especially if it's like the US Defense Force. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And everyone's looking at like the Russia Ukraine conflict at the moment and seeing Russia like ripping chips out of fridges to like power their tra- tanks or whatever's on Reddit at the moment. <laughs> and every country's just going there going like we don't want that. We're going to have local com- we're going to have local chips and we're going to have local compute manufactured. Yeah, I think that there really has been a realization over the last two or so years, yeah. not just from war, but from yeah. supply chain issues, COVID, yeah. everything else that like the same way that we make food locally, the same yeah. way that we make power locally, we need a certain yeah, compute load manufacturing yeah. capacity as a sovereign need because otherwise you're at risk of just being completely cut off. How close are you to saying data is the new oil right now? I just, <laughs> I'm not going to say data is the new oil. I mean, I've heard... I dare you to, I dare you to. Data is the new oil. Um, <laughs> I've heard some good workups of that though, you know, expanding that metaphor into oil is great but not very useful on its own and jet fuel and all this other sort of stuff. But... Uh, no, they, you refuse to say that. I refuse good. to. to good, say you pass the test. You may stay on the podcast. Uh, oh, that's good. <laughs> so, all righty, we've digressed in a half, and we're halfway through the drinks. But anything else to add? Should we do like, like, what does this mean? Like this AI day in a whole. We got new models. We got new hardware. We got new ways of training data. We're starting to see like probably one of the at least like publicly launched overviews of AI being applied in a like actual practical. Sets. Uh, anything to add? Oh, sorry. Anything to talk yeah, about I mean, that? Look, as fun as it is to like wail on Meta, uh, yeah. I, I will briefly here. Well, not not because I like have any vendetta against Meta or Facebook or any of that. Like, whatever, they're fine. Do whatever you want. They do some good AI stuff, to be honest. But if you look at the nature of the AI day and its presentations mm-hmm. compared to uh meta's presentation about the metaverse and their like work product and like we're launching legs i don't know if you saw that what's legs so (laughs) so previously they have this like vr workspace thing which is like you can go and collaborate with your colleagues but it's only like upper torsos (laughs) and their major announcement from this event was like legs coming soon and it's just people with legs (laughs) 
That's cool. But uh, I, I, I think generally a lot of like the metaverse is quite dumb. But I think if we look back maybe 10 years, AI was in that same space. It was all quite dumb. Like people would just say they were doing AI for whatever because it was like hot in a presentation and it would make yeah. your stocks go up. And I think what's really nice to see is how much AI has matured. The AI yeah. day, minus the dumb robot, was very practical, very pragmatic. Yeah. For most people who don't know a lot about AI, probably extremely boring and specific. Yeah. And to me, once now that AI in this context has reached boring and specific level, it means that it's matured enough to be a serious part yeah. of technology and part of workflows. Nobody has boring specific talks about the metaverse or VR at this stage because it's not yeah. there yet. It's all in the, you know, fluffy, everybody's going to come back to the office in yeah. 2024, but we're all going to be wearing VR headsets and be in another office in the metaverse kind of nonsense. Yeah, uh, It's very real. And I think that's yeah. good. You know, even, yeah, even if you look back to you know, previous AI days were pretty good as well, but, you know, certainly five or six years ago, yeah. um, yeah, AI was very much in the same boat that the metaverse is in today. And who knows, maybe yeah. episode 200 or however many years it'll be, 300 and something when we're talking about, uh, you know, Meta's latest <laughs> VR headset. <laughs> we're, we're sitting in the metaverse. Yeah, we're sitting this. in the metaverse. Uh, we might be getting very specific and boring, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that was another cool part of the... The whole thing. I'm, I'm just, so the, the thing for me was the real aspect as well. So I'm just going to sum that up in 2,000 fully self-driving cars to mm -hmm. 160,000 fully self-driving cars. And like you can, you, can, you can pay out Tesla for how fully self-driving they are and they might be bad, but like in a year, 2,000 to 160,000. Like next year, are we even going to be talking, talking about fully self-driving in, in the AI day? Because they've just nailed it. What are we talking about next year? Like, yeah. yeah. This is... What is it going to be next year? This is crazy to me. And they went from like 3,000 GPUs to train everything to 14,000 and they're already bottlenecked. Right. Yeah. I mean, I will say, uh, it's fully self-driving as a consumer, still not there. Like, and it's been almost there for a number of years. So, you know, to, to give a... I guess a sobering reality of what this is. Like, you're not going to be able to pop into your... He says uh, as he finishes his drink... <laughs> You're not going to be able to pop into your Tesla tomorrow and just be like, take me to France and it'll sort out the rest. Um, the technology is still very early. Uh, and yeah. even when the technology arrives, there is going to be this huge societal regulatory type change that we're needing to go through. I mean, yeah. if, you, if you put your car on fully self-driving and you hit the old lady with the trolley full of oranges... Yeah. Who goes Who to jail? gets sued yep. is the ultimate question that needs to be answered. And I think we still don't know that. Yeah. Um, and hang, hang on, stop there. I've got a great segue to the next segment. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Speaking of who gets sued, let's talk about data laundering. Oh, yes. Data <laughs> laundering. This is, a, this is a great... Did you come up with this term? No, it was the title of the article. Oh. Great article. Oh, well, yeah. you, sh you should have claimed it. I would have believed you. Oh, you, you would have believed anything <laughs> at, this, at this point. So data laundering, uh, second topic for the day, um, is uh, basically we're at this point where private companies are getting research institutions to do their dirty work. All right, so, come on, elaborate. That, that sounds more nefarious than I think it, it really is. So... What, re what is happening with all and what is underpinning a lot of the models, especially in the image generation and the video generation world, is that the data sets they're trained on are gathered and then the initial models are created and trained by research institutions. And the reason why that is, is because one, research is obviously doing research, but the second, uh, the second reason is that they don't, research does not suffer the same copyright uh, restrictions that a private company would. So this all came from a person called Simon Willison who had dug into a couple of the models and where all the training data sets came from. So if we consider Facebook's make a video model, which we talked about on last week's episode, yep. um, it has two data sets that it was trained on. The first data set has about 10.7 million clips ripped from Shutterstock. 
some of them include still including the watermarks as we've talked about as well on other episodes that that is not uncommon people yeah. so if you've been watching the streams that i've been doing on the u network uh the oxford three which probably comes from oxford the three t pet database uh half of the pets have shutter stock logos in front of them uh and the annoying thing about that data set just to take a small diversion is that People segment around the Shutterstock logo. <laughs> so all of your, like, if the cat's partially occluded by the Shutterstock logo, there's just a big gap in its face. Um, so, dear Oxford, whoever, whichever Oxford that's referring to, please fix your data set. Yeah. But anyway. Um, so Facebook, and then the second data set that Make Video comes from has about 3 million YouTube videos in it. So, uh, now the thing here is that these are research databases that were gathered mm -hmm. and then put applied to models and models were trained on these data sets that Facebook make a video took meta meta's make a video took and used to then create their make a video so so they took the data set right not a, the data a set. previously trained model and the, and and the trained models and then as well mm. and then as well stability ai which made stable diffusion yeah they commissioned the data collection and the initial model training from an outfit in Munich. And yeah. so what they receive is a trained model and a, and a data set that's been collected and they are then are, and then they are then creating commercial products from that. Facebook's is not commercial yet, but yeah, I mean it will be. It's it's heading be, in that way. It'll be integrated into a commercial product for sure. And there seems to be a little like land grab happening on by these companies because this question of copyright and who mm -hmm. owns what and who has a right to what and what people have and what infringements can uh, is allowed, sorry, what uh, what is allowed, is hasn't been answered yet by the U.S. Patent and Trade Attorney. Yeah, I, we did look. Uh, if anyone's following this closely, which means you've listened to a lot of our episodes, and thank you for doing so, if you have. Mm. We did check in with the so the OpenAI uh, responded to. A, Let me read the question out. I got it right here. I got the question that they've sub submitted. Good. Yeah. To the extent an AI algorithm or process learns its functions by ingesting large volumes of copyrighted material, does the existing statutory language, example the fair use doctrine and related case law, adequately address the legality of making such use? Question mark. Yeah. Um, so. To strip a little of the legalese back there, what that's saying is, you know, fair use is that uh, you can take content that's publicly available on the internet. You know, you can't break into Optus and steal people's passport photos. But if there are pictures, was it really that, breaking in? Well, no, <laughs> but that, that's for another podcast. We'll talk about that another day. Um, if there's pictures on the internet, you can take them and use them for certain non-commercial or you know certain purposes under fair use doctrine, including research, including research, including say criticism. You can use clips of films to give a review of a film or to provide criticism about the film, etc. And the question from the U.S. Uh, Patent Office, which you know covers to the U.S. Patent Office, yeah, yeah, or the, yeah, the discussion that's going on there is: Does the scraping of data that is publicly available wasn't nefariously uh, gathered, and use of that data in AI training models does that constitute fair use? Uh, and the outcome of this is going to say big things about a lot of these AI models because most of this data is from the internet. Uh, and OpenAI responded. They wrote a document about why they believe it is fair use and why it must be fair use to encourage uh, competition and continued innovation in this space. Um, there hasn't been a final determination on that from the USPTO or from anyone else. Um but we've, we've mentioned it a couple of times and we did look back into it. Yeah. Um, but I think what we're talking about here, this data laundering, definitely comes into that because it, it adds a lot of complexity. So, you know, it, let's, let's make a theoretical example. Um, let's say you train an autoencoder. So for people that don't know what an autoencoder is, it takes an image, it condenses that image down to a very dense representation of that image and then it reconstructs the very same image, which you know, at the outset, you're like, why the hell would you ever want to do this? The reason is that that intermediate state, that very dense representation uh, is usually much smaller in size, 
uh, and much simpler to say transmit. Mm. So if we take a massive image and can shrink it down, I can send that to you and save a bunch of bandwidth. Now, if I take a bunch of copyrighted material, shrink it down to a condensed form and send you the condensed form, but you've also got a copy of my model, which can turn the condensed form back into copyrighted material. Have I shared copyrighted material with you? Um, and you know, in the in the sense of data yeah. laundering, that is going to be a really bloody hard question to answer. And then it gets even more complex, where if you take a copyrighted image, shrink it down, I then return a cop and a very similar image that was to the copyrighted one, and then I'd use that to then train on another bottle. Like, yeah, we're like. W at what point we're in a Theseus uh, ship situation, which is the like, if I go on a ship and I replace every plank of wood on the journey, am I still on the same ship? Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, and, and yeah, it does start to break down. I mean, if you imagine, if you know, I think a lot of the thought experiments that go on in this space tend to be, let's use the human counterpart example of this, which is, let's take it as images, for example. Yeah. Like, let's say I just really love um, Pokemon. Which, you do. Which I do. I do. <laughs> I'm, I'm still a sucker for the Pokemon games. But let's say, like, I have artistic capability, which I don't. Hey, hey, you make some good images. <laughs> yeah, they're all right. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a professional artist. But let's say I was really good at drawing. And I spent a lot of my time studying images of Pokemon from the Pokemon anime. Yeah. You know, because that's nice high resolution. And learned to draw those pretty much as effectively as the original illustrators. To the point where if you saw one of my drawings, mm. you would say, oh, maybe this was a clip from the show. Now, me viewing the show a bunch and then doing my own drawings is probably not going to raise any red flags. Nobody would say, you're not allowed to do that. Yep. You watch the show. You get that Charmander off your wall. Yeah, you've got to come up with your own you know, franchise that can then be turned into card games and video games. Don't be doing Pokemons. No one's going to say that. But... If you ran an AI over every frame of the Pokemon yep. anime and then learned to generate yep. novel images in the same style, there is a little bit of a, I guess, an argumentative dissonance in that like people will treat the human counterpart to the, the AI quite differently yep. when assessing whether it's fair use or not. But I, I think one important difference there, though, is that like there is all there needs to be a commercial tinge to all of this like i am yeah. going to make money from that True. if you started True. selling True. your pokemon images in a marketplace you would technically be that, that in, is true. in breach whereas yeah. and the, and the thing with ai bringing into this is generally everyone assumes that there's a commercial application behind this as well like if if facebook sorry if meta releases make a video as an open source do whatever you want we're never going to make a dollar from it and we're going to use it to help improve how we improve some aspect of the economy then like yeah sure no one's gonna like blink an eye at that but. yeah and i mean even then if i if i made my own genre yeah yeah like so a very real example of this was i don't know if you've seen this uh is there's this game called temtem no so tell Tem me more temtem is just like it's honestly just like a pokemon ripoff <laughs> <laughs> where you catch little monsters and you train them and they battle each other it's like it's pretty much exactly <laughs> the same um, yeah, they really they they really didn't bother to hide the fact when they call one Schmikachu. Like. Yeah, but 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 it's not it's not Schmikachu. It's like, look, we took the same concept, we made our own riff on it. We're not trying to rip you off here. There's no Schmikachu and Schmarmander and yeah. Schmirtle. It's just a similar sort of idea. Yeah, it's like League of Legends and Horn and like Yeah, exactly. And like if, if I watched a bunch of Pokemon and then drew my own creatures and were like, yeah, yeah these are called Elliot Mon. Which doesn't make a lot of sense, but anyway. Like, nobody would be violating copyright there. Yeah. You know, someone who might come after me, I, I don't know what happened with Temtem. I mean, Temtem is on the Switch, which means that Nintendo must have a certain amount of yeah. okayness with it. Um, How do you spell Temtem? I'm going to get Billy Bob to look it up. T-E-M-T-E-M. -E -E Checks out. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think in the AI case, like... Oh God! The font, the font is yeah, the same. Man. The yeah, font yeah. is the same as Pokemon's. <laughs> yeah, it it is pretty pretty similar sort of concept. That 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 is that is uh, uh, Pidgeot. That 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 Temtem is Pidgeot. This is uh, yeah. This is this is blatant copyright. <laughs> yes, but as far as I mean, as far as like true copyright infringement is concerned, like this wouldn't be considered a duplicate. That's mute. That's just mute. <laughs> Stop watching the trailer. Stop watching the trailer. Um. So, you know, if we train our AI model to make 
Pokemon-like creatures, having trained on Pokemon. Yeah. But we explicitly somehow restrict it from creating something that is a Pokemon. You know, much like OpenAI is allegedly stopping you putting in famous people's names. Yeah. Um, to stop that creation. That is, I think, an even blurrier uh, example of how this all fits together. So bring us back on track. Basically, watch this space. It's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens with these models, whether they're pulled, whether the commercial restrictions are placed on them, whether there's even legal action as well, especially from like someone like Shutterstock or YouTube, because you know what? If... If Meta is making videos of YouTube-based data, and Google feels like it, there is uh, there there might be some litigation to happen over the next few years. If uh, yeah, from, a, from a from a thwarting competition thwarting. aspect, thwarting. thwarting, thwarting, thwarting. Yes. I'll try and say that after how many standard drinks have we had now? Uh, <laughs> Enough. Enough. Yes. Yes. Okay, final topic for the day. Final topic will close us out. Yeah, Stadia. Nothing to do with AI. <laughs> it's just we've mentioned it three weeks in a row now. We have. We have poor Stadia, poor Google. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't actually feel sorry for Google or Stadia itself. I do feel sorry. There's one bloke. <laughs> I don't know if there's a bloke, to be honest. There, there's one person on the internet who posted, I think, on Twitter or somewhere else, that they had spent over 6,000 hours in Red Dead Redemption 2 on Google Stadia and there was no way to transfer this their saved data. They were very upset, as you can imagine. It's like a like, full, that's like a year and a half yeah, of I mean, your life. That, your that's hours. a lot of time. I mean, number one, that that's a hell of a lot of Red Dead Redemption. <laughs> I mean, congrats to Rockstar for making a game that had that many hours in yeah. it. But, uh, I mean, it's a bit rough to just shut the system down. Uh, and I mean, there's that meme of like, you know, everything that Google makes will get shut down. Yeah. There's the Google graveyard. And so the reason why I wanted to bring this up is we were talking about it last week and I mentioned on last week, uh, last episode that, yeah, they weren't able to solve the technology issues. Turns out they were. Yeah. Turns out that like they were very much able to get for specific games. Like, look, you're not going to be competing in the world champions for COD anytime soon um, with Google Stadia, but they were able to get the latency down to a point where people were able to play these games. But what ended up happening is that anyone that was serious enough to play games wanted their own setup because it's not just about like mm. when you're gaming, you're not just there to like obviously performance is an aspect, but you're there for the headphones, you're there for the mouse, you're there for the keyboard, you're there for the like screen, you're there for like you're there for your gaming setup. This is like setting up your home cinema. Sure, you could go to the cinema yourself, but like the home cinema, like the home gaming is a is a feature that you really, really want and you're proud of. And mm. they ran into this they ran into this like customer issue rather than a technological issue, which I found interesting. Yeah, I'd believe that. I mean, look, if Google wants to stream some shit over the internet, yeah. I think they're gonna be able to do that. Like I I really yeah. don't think that's gonna be their bottleneck. They have the hardware, they know how to spit things over bandwidth, they're pretty good at compressing data. I mean, like YouTube is a pretty golden example that like if they want to get visuals over the internet, yeah. they can do it. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a hard niche to crack this sort of cloud gaming setup. Yeah. And I think you're right. Like people want a lot of control over it. Um, and also I just think like Google doesn't have the reputation or the history in the gaming space that people are going to say, yeah, absolutely. Let's uh, let's go all in on this. You know, if Steam suddenly did gaming streaming, or if Sony did it for PlayStation, which they do in some jurisdictions, jurisdictions, some countries, um, or Nintendo did it, which yeah. they are about to do with a bunch of the Resident yeah. Evil games, people say, okay, cool. Like, you know, games. Clearly, you understand what the priorities are here. This is fine. I'm going to trust you, but. Yeah, it, oh, that, was, that was just sugar. <laughs> just sugar. Yeah, that uh, keeps you healthy. But yeah, <laughs> Excuse I mean, me. to me, it'd be like, you know, LG doing video game streaming. Yeah. Like, yeah, maybe they technically could, but should they? Yeah. <laughs> Why are they doing it? But you said to me when we were preparing for this um, that, yeah, now Google's just shut it down so they can sell it to the yeah. PlayStations of the world, yeah, look, the Sonys of the world, sorry. I don't think Google wants to be in consumer grade. Yeah. Video gaming streaming. I think Google wants to be an enterprise-grade platform plays for 
video game streaming. So they've now done a proof of concept, which they can advertise to Sony, Nintendo, my, well, probably not Microsoft, any of these other yeah. major providers yeah. to say, look, you want to do this? Holy Run crap. it on Google Cloud. That's interesting because Microsoft owns Xbox and they also own EB now, right? Who did they buy recently? It was EB? Activision Blizzard. Sorry, Activision. Activision yeah. Blizzard. Like, now Sony is sitting there shaking their boots going, we need a, we need a cloud provider. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know who Sony uses as their back end. They might run their own gear, but um, they do game streaming for, at least in the US, they do streaming of some older titles onto yeah. the PS5. Rather than running an emulator, they just run it in the cloud and stream it, uh, which is pretty interesting. Very cool. And then the final topic for the week. The final, final topic. The final, for the final week. is actually just last week we talked about the omniverse, and I got confused as to whether the omniverse was a thing or I actually meant the metaverse, and I just made it up. Turns yeah. out the omniverse was a thing. So it, there you go. Nvidia's thanks. omniverse is a real time graphic collection platform created by Nvidia. So I was kind of right. There you go. Nvidia's omniverse is created by Nvidia. You heard <laughs> it here first, folks. Elon Musk is going to buy. Uh, who do we say? Nvidia. In Nvidia. And it's going to be Elon Musk's. Uh, NVIDIA Omniverse created by NVIDIA mm. and Elon Musk. The Muskverse. The Muskverse. <laughs> brought to you. This episode's been brought to you by... <laughs> by Musk, by Musk. Um, no, very good, man. I mean, look, look, let's wrap it up. I have no idea how long we've been going for. Probably roughly an hour. About about um, this many drinks worth is what we've been going yeah, for. Yeah, one caipirinha worth. To any of our uh, Brazilian listeners, uh, what a great beverage. Um, yeah. Elliot's Portuguese isn't half bad. You can hear him speak it on... Uh, on my whisper stream, yeah. yeah. Look, I'm out of practice, as I expressed on that whisper stream in my one Portuguese statement. But uh, look, it was good enough. For, it was good enough for whisper to understand you. Right? That's true. That's true. Uh, look, if you're watching on YouTube, thanks again for being here. If you're listening uh, and want to watch us gesticulate a whole bunch and, and do all that sort of yeah. stuff, check and us out Midas, on YouTube and see Midas. Midas, Midas features yeah. in the video. And see Midas, my dog, um, and a whole bunch of other videos. Do check us out on YouTube. Uh, the custom URL feature on YouTube is currently paused uh, due to YouTube's technical difficulties. So you'll have to go to youtube.com slash something very long. It starts with a U. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it is. But if you just search high output AI, it'll come up. Yeah, you'll definitely find us. Um, so that's show that. Note, show notes will be there. They will. Find hit Any comments, feedback, hit us up on Twitter. Do yes. the subscribe thing. Do the bell thing. Do the like thing. Do the comment thing. Do all the things. Yeah, just do all the stuff. Just like, I don't know, talk to us. We're, we're pretty open to hear what uh, you all want to hear about. We've made it a rule to reply to absolutely everything. Yeah, including some of the spam comments. So, uh, yeah. yeah, if you want to leave spam on our channel, uh, I mean, don't. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> look, any real comments will be, will be responded to. Do check in. We're pretty open to feedback. Uh, and thanks again for being part of this. We Thank love you. doing it and hopefully you love watching it. Yeah, goodbye, everybody. And here is Pup Pup. Is Midas. Ta ta, everyone. everyone. Until next time. <laughs>